Hi folks, let's use our Haas VM3 and the TR200Y 5-axis trunnion to machine this turbofan blade. So last week we machined an Arduino case. We used positional 5-axis work, so 3 plus 2. Relatively simple, still awesome, very functional, and probably how a lot of 5-axis machines are actually used, just to reorient the part and minimize setups. This is true 5-axis machining with some really awesome tool passes. It's really cool to see the machine move like this. We're gonna go over three things in this video. We'll go over the CAD of how we made this part. We'll do that at the end though. But really the focus is gonna be the camp. It's our foray into true simultaneous five axis tool paths and they are totally different than three axis or even fourth axis tool paths. And then lastly, let's talk about what we learned and hopefully what you guys can learn. And I wanna bring you guys along for this journey. We are new to five axis. We are learning, it's a pretty steep learning curve. There's a lot of new operations of tool paths that you just don't see in three axis like Swarf and Contour and Flow. Although ironically, we're actually using a tool path under the 3D menu, which we'll get into here in a second. So it's a turbo fan blade, sort of. If you look up turbo fan blade, it and Blisks are kind of that quintessential five axis type of part. We poked around for some turbo fan blade models and I realized, you know what? I really want something that we can control. So we just hopped into Fusion and made our own. First off, we've got a piece of raw material. We're throwing it in our self-centering dovetail style vise. Throw in our Renishaw probe and we're using the probing routines within Autodesk HSM slash Fusion which I really like because it just makes it clear what your process is, what your workflow is, how you're orienting this part, how you might set up the next one. After the probing, a quick face. We're using a really long stick out tool. Normally we would use a much shorter tool, but this worked fine. And more importantly, it's the tool we're going to use for the next adaptive operation. After we face it, look, we just reoriented. So we're quickly going to make use of positional work to do an adaptive toolpath. We're actually gonna do two adaptive toolpaths. And the key here is under the adaptive geometry, we're doing tool orientation. And we've picked this axis right here. So if we look at the model, if we orient the part this way, we can actually get to a significant portion, this whole side here and most of this side here. Only a small portion is occluded. What we'll then do is we'll duplicate that setup and under the geometry here, we'll pick the other work axis, which will reposition the spindle in line with this axis, which will present the rest of that. And by using rest machining, we've got two different adaptive strategies that are going to get rid of the bulk of that material. And that's important because when we come in to do our surfacing tool paths, we want to present the cutting tool with a relatively equal amount of tool pressure. So by roughing this out in the two different orientations, we're gonna improve the surface finishes and tool life on that surfacing op. We're trying to do it all here. We're trying to learn, but we also want to share this with you guys. So we did a lot of dry cutting, which is normally not the best way to cut aluminum. You'll see it at the end, we did some comparisons of showing how much it affects the surface finish, but it makes it so much more interesting to watch. So I would suggest leaving the cool on when you can, but again, for here, we're having some fun. Want to share this with you guys, cool it off. We're done with our roughing. Let's switch over to a quarter inch ball end mill on a relatively longer gauge length holder. Again, this is our first simultaneous part. We were nervous. We, we did not want to crash the machine. We wanted to have good visibility. And the tool path looked good and we were comfortable relying on that tool path. But where the simultaneous five axis stuff can throw you is in the linking moves and the transition sort of in and out of the cut. But before we go through this blend tool path and the true simultaneous five axis motion, let's rewind for a second. You can see here we're hogging out with about a two inch gauge length stick out. And with a three eighth inch tool, two inches long, we're at over five times stick out. That's not ideal. You really like that number to be four or less. But this is one of the other areas where five axis work can really help with your machining workflows and parts, even if you don't have complex shapes. 
And we're going to skip a little bit ahead to this five axis part that we've been working on. And it's mostly three plus two. It's a little LS3 engine block that we made kind of a replica version of. Take a look at these pockets for the crankshaft. The first few I could get to with a regular end mill, no problem. But as you get further down, we want to machine this whole thing in one operation from the top. I don't have any way of getting to these. That's where five axis can really shine. Fusion does a pretty good job with 3D contour. Contour as well as blend are two of the tool paths that have five axis functionality as an option. So if you go into 3D contour, under passes tab, multi-axis tilting. What this is gonna let you do is take a regular two axis type part like this, but tip the tool over so that you can get into this part right here. So what do I mean by that? This is awesome. Again, the first one normal, just holding the tool normal to this face, come down and do an adaptive to machine this out. No big deal all day long. Same thing with the second one. The third one, we're gonna switch over to a 3 8 inch ball end mill. And by forcing multi-axis tilt, which automatically turns on shaft and holder detection, it's going to tip that tool over and it's really an absolutely beautiful thing. It's gonna carve that out, maintaining awareness so that it doesn't crash our tool or tool holder. And the benefit of this is we can keep a relatively short tool stick out, which will increase our stiffness, our rigidity, or allow us to go a little bit faster. And we can rely on the stiffer parts like a tool holder and the spindle itself. Really, really awesome motion. So stick around. We're gonna have this video out here in a few weeks showing how we have made and are continuing to work on this guy. So back to our turbo fan blade or pseudo turbo fan blade. And what we're doing now is just one of the coolest things that we've ever seen. And like I mentioned in the Arduino video, it's one thing to hold a five axis part or even watch a demo part run or someone else's machine run. But when you've actually programmed it yourself, there's just something that's amazing and mesmerizing. And for me to think that we started like 10 years ago in our apartment with a tag and we're now able to run, it may not be quite state of the art, but it's pretty darn close to state of the art type stuff to me is just absolutely awesome. And it's fun for me to, after moving to Ohio four years ago and really working my butt off, to take a few weeks off, so to say, and just have fun experimenting and learning and pushing myself. How do we learn this stuff? How do we get the tool paths to work, the cam, the setup, the work holding, all that stuff. It's really, really fun. And it's just amazing to watch the machines. It really is. So let's take a look at this blend tool path. I had wanted to use Flow, and Flow is a, a toolpath that I've heard some really, really good things about. Flow toolpaths are driven by the ISO curves of the model. What that means is it's actually relying on the CAD model. And if you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, doesn't all CAM rely on the CAD model? No, there's an intermediary step uh, where I believe the term is tessellation. It takes this CAD model that has these nice flowing shapes, and it actually turns them into hundreds of thousands or millions or more small triangles. Something you may have seen if you've ever used an STL file. Flow is, is different, it's actually very different. It's able to directly use those ISO curves. My understanding is that right now, the flow toolpath infusion isn't bad at all, but the ISO curves from the CAD side either aren't up to par or the two aren't talking to each other. So we want to do some more experimenting with this, but short answer is we got better results out of blend. And if you're looking at your 3D toolpath and you don't see blend, go to the drop down menu, view, show text commands, and type cam.beta mode slash on. And when you close Fusion, it will automatically turn itself off. So you have to turn it back on. Or if you want to turn it off, you can type cam.beta mode slash off. But putting yourself in beta mode will reveal this blend toolpath. And again, that's what we use. Card here to the NYC CNC page for this project where we'll have a copy of this file. And blend is quite similar to the 3D contour in that it's intrinsically a three axis toolpath operation, but under the passes tab, we can check use multi-axis. When we machined those crankshaft pockets on the V8 engine block, we used the use multi-axis feature along with that shaft and holder detection. And the point there 
was to tip our tool over so that it could reach those really deep pockets just coming at them from a side angle. Here, I don't need shaft and holder detection. We're working in totally free space. There's plenty of room around our part. But the reason we want to use multi-axis is so that we can tip the tool forward into its side. That way we avoid cutting with the tip of the tool and instead are cutting with a much better area of the tool, better surface finishes, better ability to create that chip and evacuate it. Now I suspect we'd be a little bit better off if we tipped it over even more, but in this video we went forward and sideways by 10 degrees. And what's awesome is this toolpath is incredibly easy to program. Not all the five axis toolpaths are. We just had to choose two faces and two chains. So first face and second face, and the chains would be the outside edge here and here, click OK. And we literally have full simultaneous five axis cam tool paths. Just amazing. Speeds and feeds are still things that you need to experiment or get nailed down. Obviously step over is going to affect how the step over of each tool path, which will directly correlate to the scalloping uh, or the surface finishes of your part. What we found, especially as we're learning, was we kept the feed rates relatively low just to make sure on our machine Everything was smooth. Smooth is the key. It's fun to want to think about going super fast, but if your B axis or your C axis aren't keeping up with the feed rates of the machine, that's not a good thing. And what we wanted to see was just nice, smooth, flowing tool paths, not having jerkiness, jitters, or, or lagging. And again, we're so new to this, we're just learning, but that so far was the recipe that we found for success. How do we make that turbofan on the CAD side of things? Sketch, slot, center point slot, sketch out our slot along the base, stop sketch, construct offset plane, we create a plane offset from here, 1.3 inches, S slot, we'll do another center point slot on this plane and now you can choose what you want to do you can have it line up or you can have it offset we'll do it offset at an angle i like to sketch things at kind of an extreme and then use formulas or to constraints to bring them back in so d for dimension i'll create the dimension between these two as 15 degrees and we're done hit stop sketch edit that sketch, click the line, hit X, that'll turn it into a construction geometry. It makes it easier for the next step. S is your keyboard shortcut, L-O-F-T. We're gonna loft this profile up to this profile. By turning that line into a construction line, it means uh, we can easily select the full profile of our part. And there we've got our sort of very pseudo turbo fan blade, not a real turbo fan blade, folks, to be clear. Um, but we could do things like change the dimensions of this. Say, say we only want it to be one inch. Have it taper down. Taper down like so. And adjust as you see fit or to get the shape you're looking for. The piece on the left, I'm guessing a good portion of this was our own fault and just how we are learning or programming it, but we didn't get good results for flow and we did get pretty darn good results with blend. What I think is awesome about this picture is you can see the difference between no coolant and coolant. Uh, the top portion of that is where we had coolant off. You can see a tiny bit of a compromised surface. I suspect some of that is from the lack of lubricity, but more of it's probably from chips getting recut. So as that chip is there, it's wedging itself in between the cutting edge and the part, which is causing some of that marks. Pretty darn good surface finish where we had coolant. And then we left the bottom part of it just to show kind of what it looks like between where we were machining and the roughing passes on the part. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. More to come. Again, we've been super excited working out with this V8 engine block. We also made some of the first Johnny 5 robot parts on the 5-axis. Take care. See you soon.